The church father Augustine once said, Faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. The Bible says that those who are not Christian are in fact spiritually blind. They cannot see the goodness of God in the person of Christ. Conversely, a Christian is one whom God has spiritually opened the eyes of that they might see who Jesus is and what he has done to give them a new heart and a new life. Sadly, some Christians, in effect, choose spiritual blindness. Akin to someone who has perfectly good sight and chooses instead to close their eyes. Such people are guilty and not just victims as they choose willingly to not see the person of Jesus, the work of Jesus, and the life of Jesus that is set before them. Indeed, faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. Howdy, Marcel. We are starting a new book of the Bible today. Very excited about this book of the Bible, particularly the great opening we have today in 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. If you've got a Bible, go there. If you don't own a Bible, feel free to grab some on your way. Get one for yourself, family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, enemies. Just give them away. <laughs> give them away. Give two to your enemy. You never know. They might be a friend. Just uh, turn there. And uh, as you're turning there, if you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. You'll still be able to follow along. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing. We're going through 2 Peter. We recently concluded our study of 1 Peter. And this will take us through most of the summer months. We'll do a one-month topical sermon series, basically in the month of August. And then in the fall, we're going to start the book of Luke. And we're going to take years and go through the whole book of Luke, the chronological life of Jesus. Yes, years. But they'll be great years. They'll be phenomenal years, years you will not regret. Uh, and uh, what we're going to do, you can be praying for uh, the preaching and theology department under the oversight of Pastor AJ that I'm part of. We are leading a tour of Greece and Israel this summer, and the tour company is great, and they're allowing us to bring an audio and video crew with us. And so we'll be shooting all the sites in Israel on uh, amazing high-def red cameras, industry standard, and then we'll work that into the Luke series. So as we're following the story of Jesus, you'll get to see the various places like where he was born and where he grew up and where he was baptized and where the Last Supper was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the place of his crucifixion, the place of his resurrection. So we'll actually get to share with you visually all of the great geographic uh, support for the book of Luke. So you can be a prayer for us. We're putting all that together. Very excited. In the meantime, Second Peter is where we find ourselves. And if you are new, the uh, trial study guide will help you get teed up for the series. You can also find it at the number 8witnesses.com. And here's how it works. We meet on Sunday and we study the Bible and respond and partake of communion and sing and repent and worship collectively as God's people. And then we scatter in hundreds of groups meeting all over the region throughout the course of the week. We'd love to get you in one if you are not already. Most of the church, the majority, is in a group. And the questions that guide those dinner and discussion times are found here in. Um, let's do this. Let's read, pray, go. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory, his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We'll pray and get to work. Father, I thank you for the text today. I love it. I am really fired up, God. And I thank you that I get to teach this section of Scripture to our people. God, I take your promise that you want to give us knowledge and that you want that knowledge to allow us to enjoy the fullness of your grace and to be satisfied in the peace that you give. So we ask, Lord God, today for that knowledge, that knowledge of grace that would give us peace. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and instruct us through the Scriptures and Holy Spirit, I ask that you would allow me to serve well in Jesus' good name. Amen. We'll jump right in. I'm so fired up about this. I woke up at 4 a.m. ready to go. Nowhere to go, but ready to preach. I I preached it a few times before we even started the day. I was so excited, I just had to get a few out of my system. This is an amazing introduction to an incredible book of the Bible. And it starts by telling us who the author is, Simeon Peter. And Simeon, or Simon, that's his old name. And Peter, that's his new name. Simeon represents his old way of life. Peter represents his new way of life. Simeon is who he was before he met Jesus. Peter is who Jesus renamed him to be. The first name typifies his birth, and the second typifies his new birth. And right at the very start, he is showing us that Jesus changes people and makes a difference, and his life is an amazing example of that. He says he is both a servant and an apostle, one who serves by leading. The best leaders are servants, and he is a servant leader. And the recipients are those, he says in chapter 1, verse 1, to those who have obtained a faith. Obtained here meaning a gift. Faith includes the collective doctrine and essential instruction about the person and work of Jesus and the ability to trust in a saving way in who Jesus is and what he has done. And what he's saying is that this faith, this saving faith is a gift. It's something we obtain. It's not something we earn. It's something that's gifted to us. It's not something that we merit. This means that Christians, by definition, should be humble, not I'm smart, I chose God, I pursued God, I looked at all the religions, and I picked the best one, aren't I bright and insightful? No, I've obtained a gift. I've received the gift of saving faith in the person and the work of Jesus. And then he tells us not only who the author is and who the recipients are, but what the purpose of the entirety of the letter is in chapter 1, verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Knowledge is the point and purpose of the book. Knowledge about God in general and Jesus Christ in particular. He wants us to know and to grow in knowledge of who Jesus is and what he's done. And he says that as we grow in this knowledge of Jesus, we grow in an understanding and appreciation of the fullness of God's grace, his lavish gift of mercy and compassion and affection and forgiveness to us, and it also, this knowledge of Jesus that allows us to enjoy the fullness of his grace, culminates in greater peace, a greater assurance, a greater certainty that God's affection will not be removed, that he is for us in every way. And that he is going to unpack two major cataclysmic life-changing, absolutely thrilling doctrines. And he is going to set them before us to put in course of motion all that he is going to teach in the remainder of the book. If you don't get these two, the rest of the book is absolutely, utterly confusing. The first letter, 1 Peter, was pastoral. 2 Peter is polemical. The first was to help suffering Christians. The second is to help them defend against heresy, sinful living, and false teaching. 
And if all you do is read all the things you need to do in 2 Peter, you can end up being a legalist and a moralist and a religious person. And so to combat against that and to get you to rightly understand and appreciate and apply the book, he sets before us two amazing doctrines. Did I say that? Incredible doctrines. Phenomenal doctrines. Did I make my point? Justification, can hardly say it. Regeneration, he puts them together. We at Mars Hill, we love these doctrines. We love them. They change everything. What's he trying to say? Pay attention. That's what he's trying to say. And the first point is justification, which is Jesus' work for us. Before Peter tells us to do anything, he tells us what Jesus has done. This is so important. Before you do anything with God, you need to understand what God has done for you in Christ. Justification is the theological nomenclature for what Jesus has done for us. He says it this way, 2 Peter 1, 1 and 2. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Here's the big question that the doctrine of justification seeks to answer. How can we as sinners stand before God? He's holy, we're unholy. He's sinless, we're sinful. He's faithful, we're unfaithful. He's righteous, we're unrighteous. He's good, we're bad. How can we possibly on the day of judgment, and just so you know, there is a day of judgment. Jesus promised as much. You and I will die, we will stand before God, we will give an account. His word is law, and he is sovereign judge over all. How in the world could we possibly stand before the God of the Bible and expect anything other than hell? Some say, I don't know how God could send people to hell. My question is, how could God take anyone to heaven? That's the mystery to me. Now, hell makes sense. You've all sinned. You've all rebelled. You've all committed cosmic treason. You've all declared war. I don't want to be with you. Fair enough. I don't have my worst enemies living at my house either. Hell makes perfect sense. Heaven is scandalous. How could we possibly stand before God? How could God declare us righteous, receive us as justified, and still be a good God? Any judge who takes those who are guilty and then declares them to be innocent is by definition no longer a just judge. There are various ways that people try and answer this question. I'll share six with you. Five are wrong. The first is there are those who are hard-hearted. They don't care. I don't know if there's a God. If there is a God, I don't worry about it. If there's a judgment, I don't worry about it. I'm not sure there will be a judgment. I don't know if I'm good or bad. I don't care. I am who I am. I think what I think. I say what I say. I do what I do. Deal with it, and God can deal with it. These are just hard-hearted, stubborn, stiff-necked, unrepentant people. At their logical conclusion, they're sociopaths. They don't care about God, judgment, heaven, hell, or the well-being of anyone else. You just have to work around them. They're completely self-absorbed, and they'll declare themselves to just be true to themselves, being authentic to their totally depraved, wicked, selfish, evil, corrupt, nasty nature. If you're with that person, nudge them so that they understand that this point is for them. Okay, now we'll give you a moment to do that. Now... That's the first option. You could just be a proud person. The truth is most people want to some degree, in some way, have a sense of righteousness or goodness or morality. They, they want to have some reason to be aware of their own dignity. And they work it out in some really evil ways. The proud person assumes they're good enough. Number two is the proud person. They're not trying really hard. They're not being really religious. Not trying to earn God's favor. They assume God graves on a curve. I'm good. I'm sure when I stand before God, he'll say, look, nobody's perfect. You did better than most. You certainly did better than your brother. Come on in. And what we tend to do is we 
proud people tend to compare themselves to other people instead of Jesus, and so they think they're better than they are. Now, that was me. That was me up until age 19. I thought I was better than everyone else. Moral, proud. I'm not trying to be religious, not trying to go to church, not trying to pray, read the Bible so that God will love me. I figure, of course he loves me. I'm special. Who doesn't love me? I'm a good person. And I had this amazing revelation from a drunken frat guy. I have not received much theological instruction from drunken frat guys, but I had this profound moment as a college freshman. I didn't drink at all, because this was my morality. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't do drugs, I didn't punch anyone who didn't deserve it. I was moral, (laughs) very moral. And I'm at a frat party, because I was in a frat until I kind of moved out, and they kind of kicked me out, and it depends on who you talk to. But anyways, I was at this frat party, and this drunken frat guy's drinking, he's like, do you want a beer? I was like, no, I don't drink. He says, oh, you think you're better than me? I said, yes. (laughs) Yes, I do. And he asked me this bizarre question. He said, uh, so what, you probably think I'm going to hell? Yes, I do. I'm better than you and you're kindling. That's exactly how I see it. And again, I'm not going to church, I'm not a Christian. Just proud, moral, and (laughs) he asked me this amazingly insightful drunk frat guy question. He asked, how good do you need to be to go to heaven? I thought, I don't know, at least as good as me. (laughs) And I don't know if he had a little Baptist background in him or what, but he's like, I thought you needed to be perfect. Hmm, that's pretty good for a drunken frat guy. (laughs) I thought, yeah, how good do you need to be to go to heaven? And I read Jesus' words in Matthew's gospel where it says that we are to be perfect as God is perfect. And I thought, well, I'm not perfect. I mean, I'm close, (laughs) but I'm not perfect. And if you got to be, then I started thinking, well, if God's perfect and heaven's perfect and I'm imperfect, that doesn't seem like a good fit. I started wondering, huh. See, proud people like me just assume we're good enough and we look down on other people and we assume that we're better than they are and God grades on a curve and we'll be fine. And that's not true because God's Standard is perfection and all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Thought, word, deed, motive, omission, not doing what we're supposed to, commission, doing what we ought not do. The third way that people pursue their righteousness is through vague general spirituality. The spiritual person, they're spiritual but not with much understanding or reference toward God. These are people who, they don't believe in demons. They believe all that is spiritual is good. And they don't really know about God. You say, who is God? I don't know. He's just, he's this cosmic divine force. And I, I just, I connect with him. And what general vague spirituality tends to be, it's me-ism. It's just going into me. So I, I meditate and I, I do yoga and I think about myself and I connect with myself and I love myself and I just hug myself. I just care about myself. I get to know myself and I esteem myself and I embrace myself and I better myself and I just try to live in cosmic rhythm with the rest of creation. So I recycle. I use words like organic and holistic and integrative and I walk to work and sometimes I bike and I spay and neuter my pets and, <laughs> you know, I drink decaf. That's what I do. And I'm sure when I stand before God, he'll say, oh, you're in the flow. You're totally (laughs) in the flow. Amazing. Come on and just flow right in. (laughs) Right? Just the spiritual prayer. Who's God? I don't know. Why do you keep going into you and not out to him? I don't know. Why don't you understand there's a difference between Satan and demons and good and evil and not all spirituality is good and you really are a sinner and building your identity on other, anyone other than Jesus and living your life apart from God, that's all sin and you're spiritual like the demons are spiritual. It's not enough to deal with our sin problem. The fourth option is the secular person. The secular person, they want to be righteous, they want to be moral, they want to be good, they want to be better than everyone else, they want to fix the earth so they are cause-oriented. And if you want to know what the cause are, just read the bumper sticker, read the 
t-shirt, read the blog, read the Facebook. They'll let you know what the deal is. They've always got a cause. Save this animal, save this tree. It's always something, always some cause. Political candidate, moral cause, issue. They wave the flag, they beat the drum, they wear the t-shirt, they put forth the bumper sticker. They're proclaiming to the world, I'm better than you are because I have a cause and your cause is not as good as my cause and I'm righteous and I'm moral and I'm good and I'm fixing the earth and you're ruining it, you pathetic little miscreant. They don't say it like that, but that's what they mean in their heart. Some of you are here with a cause-oriented person. It's always the same thing. They think, well, I'll stand before God, and he will say, of course you get to be with me forever. You were so faithfully devoted to the cause. It's not the cause of Christ. Wrong cause. Even if it's a good cause, it's not the ultimate cause. And cause-oriented people, they tend to be haughty and proud. They think they're better than everyone else. And they like to ask you, what do you do regarding this issue or cause so that they can look down on you and judge you because that's what secular, moral, religious people do. They're fundamentalists without any God. (laughs) They don't know that. But this is how they operate. Number five, there are religious people. There are religious people in all kinds of religions. Every religion is about how to make yourself righteous in the sight of God. Reincarnate, pay off your karmic debt, go to Mecca, work really hard, deny yourself pleasure, do something to make yourself righteous. We'll deal with the Christian form because it's the most nefarious and worthless. And the Christian form is, yes, I trust in Jesus plus something that I do. It's Jesus plus And there are usually three options, Jesus plus theology. So I'll stand before God, and when he says, so what is the source of your righteousness? He will say, it's Jesus plus I have sound doctrine. I read lots of books. I can out-argue people with other positions. I've memorized verses. I've even read dead guys. You must let me in. I can pass the test. The second form of religious righteousness is Jesus plus ministry. Well, I know God will accept me and I know that he will approve of me because I serve him and I tithe and I do good things and I pour my life out to others and I have all of this fruitfulness and all of this service and I've done so much. God would look at me and say, this is amazing. I'm so proud of you. You did such a great job. Come on in. I'm looking for winners like you. And the third is Jesus plus morality. Those are people who read the Bible and they make a list of don't do this and do do that. They checklist merits, demerits, and they feel like they could stand before God and say, yeah, I belong to Jesus, but also look at my report card. I'm a good person. I didn't do the bad things and I did all the good things. And they realize the worst thing is keeping that list. They, They miss that whole point. Is it bad to have theological convictions? Is it bad to serve in ministry? Is it bad? to want to live a holy life? Not at all. But none of those things justify you, make you righteous in the sight of God. And none of them contribute anything to your justification, your status of righteousness in the sight of God. Jesus plus anything ruins everything. And this is what happened with the Galatians. They had a group called the Judaizers. And for them it was Jesus plus circumcision. You really belong to God if you love Jesus and are circumcised. And Paul rebuked that as a false gospel. So we say, well, what is the answer? Now, this, this is mind-bending. Just read this. To those, that's us who are Christian, if you are a Christian, have obtained a faith, it's a gift, of equal standing with ours. Let that phrase sit of equal standing with ours. What? See, most of you don't really believe this. Who who writes this? Peter, who's he speaking of? The apostles. So what's he saying? Your status with God is equal to Peter's. Now think of this. This is this is absolutely unbelievable. Okay, Peter. Who's Peter? Well, Peter's a fisherman initially. God enters into human history, 
as the man Jesus Christ. He adds to his divinity humanity. And he goes looking for Peter. And he invites Peter to be his disciple. And Peter spends three years as a hand-selected group of 12, getting personally trained by Jesus. This is incredible. Whatever school you went to, it's not that good. Can you imagine what that would be like? There's God. You're reading the Bible. You're like, I have a question. <laughs> you're going to get a great answer. <laughs> that's, qu that's quite an instructor. He is there as an eyewitness to see Jesus walk on water, feed the multitudes with a little boy's lunch. He saw Jesus perform miracles and heal and teach. He was hand-selected by Jesus to be part of the inner three circle of disciples. He'll talk about going up to the Mount of Transfiguration in the ensuing weeks. On the Mount of Transfiguration, it was just Peter, James, and John. And who showed up to hang out with them? Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. I don't know if they had name tags or what. I don't know how he recognized them, but they came down and they're on the mountain and Jesus shines in glory. And there's Peter. Hi, who are you? Moses. Wow. <laughs> and who are you? Elijah. <laughs> nice. Don't I have a nice perk? <laughs> he was there when Jesus ate the last supper. He was there when Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. He was there when Judas betrayed him. He was there when Jesus was arrested. He was there when Jesus was crucified. And when Jesus rose from death, he called for Peter. And he told Peter, basically, in so many words, I forgive you of your sin. I need you to be a pastor and go teach the Bible and feed my sheep. And Peter's name is always listed first, and he's the leader of the early church. And at this moment of this writing, he is arguably the most spiritually authoritative man alive on planet Earth. And oh, by the way, he wrote two books of the Bible. That's his resume. And what he says is, your faith is of equal standing with ours. Insofar as righteousness is concerned in the sight of God, you stand on ground that is equal to Peter. Now, some of you are saying, that can't be true. He wrote the Bible. I can't even find mine. <laughs> he was crucified upside down. <laughs> I sin all the time. There's no way I'm as righteous as Peter. Positionally, in Christ, you are as righteous as Peter. Do you believe that? If you do, it changes everything. We call this the doctrine of justification. It is the issue that in many ways, undergirded the Protestant Reformation, caused a breach between Protestantism and Catholicism. It is absolute bedrock to everything we believe at Mars Hill Church. And if you drill down to the bedrock, this is exactly what we believe. And he uses these words, faith and grace in Jesus Christ. We believe that justification is by faith through grace in Christ alone. He says it this way. Listen, words matter. Hear these words. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says that Jesus Christ is our God says it plainly, and he's our Savior. And our standing is equal to Peter's because he has the same righteousness that we do. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is absolutely mind boggling. This is overwhelming. This changes everything. Let me explain how this works. God becomes a man, lives a perfect, sinless, righteous life, Jesus. He goes to the cross, and he does something 
for us. We we'll use the old language of imputation or reckoning. Some of you say, I've heard this before, but do you believe it yet? My sin, all of it, past, present, and future, along with every Christian, was imputed, reckoned, given to Jesus Christ. My God and Savior, just like Peter says, and he suffered and he died in my place for my sin. And all of his righteousness was imputed to me and all of God's children or reckoned or given to me. Martin Luther rightly called this the great exchange my sin to Jesus, his righteousness to me. That's why he uses words like grace. This is a gift. It's obtained, something that's been granted to us, not deserved by us. Something we access by faith, not by our own efforts and religion and morality and spirituality and causality. 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible says it this way. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is such an enormous issue that on 222 occasions, the New Testament talks about being justified and justification. This is everything. John Calvin says it this way, the principle of the whole doctrine of salvation and the foundation of all religion. That's how he explains justification by faith. Martin Luther says, quote, justification is the issue on which the church stands or falls. So when you stand before Jesus at the end of time for judgment, there's only one correct answer as to your righteousness. You don't have any. You have no righteousness, but you've been gifted Christ's righteousness, his perfect righteousness. You can't add to it. It's a damnable thing to think you can add anything to the work of Jesus because on the cross he said, quote, it is finished. The great exchange was accomplished. My condemnation for his salvation, my death for his life, my failure for his perfection, my sin for his righteousness, the exchange took place and it's received by faith and it's enjoyed by grace and it's all made possible by Jesus Christ whom Peter rightly declares both our God and our Savior. Now, in saying this, you need to know that positionally then, as he says, you have equal standing with Peter. Equal standing with Peter. If you're like me and you come from a Catholic background, your view of Peter is as this almost superhero spiritual figure. Equal standing. Because Peter's righteousness is the same as my righteousness. That's Christ's righteousness. You can't be any more righteous than that. It's a gift. This is why Christians are so happy. This is why we call it good news. This is why we hate religion so much. Religion says you need to do something to make yourself righteous. You need to do something to contribute to your righteousness. And the gospel says no. Thank Jesus and enjoy it. Thank Jesus and enjoy it. And some of you are hearing this. And watch my words. You ruin it because you watch daytime talk television. You're overwhelmed by godless self-help talk and ideology. And you believe stupid things. You don't have what he calls knowledge. You have what the Bible calls folly. Some of you would say, well, yeah, I understand all of this. And I know that Jesus forgives me, and I just can't forgive myself. 
Oh, that sounds so pious, so spiritual, so cute. It's so, it just has this ring of stench to it. It's unbelievable. (laughs) And what you are saying, if you hold that position is, I know that my God and Savior forgives me, but there's a God above my God, namely me, and I just can't forgive myself. This is the inane stupidity of worldly culture. It is not biblical wisdom. It is not what he calls biblical knowledge. You hear this all the time in our culture. You need to love yourself. You need to forgive yourself. You need to embrace yourself. You need to adore yourself. You need to esteem yourself. You need to learn to forgive yourself. We sin against God. The psalmist says rightly, against you only, Lord God, have I sinned. There will be a day of judgment, and here's what will not happen. You will not die and stand before a mirror. You will, you will die and stand before Jesus. He's the judge, not you. He's the one who forgives you, not you. He's the one who declares you forgiven and righteous, not you. And if what you say in this false, inane, hyper bizarre, worldly, demonic spirituality that I can't forgive myself. What you're saying is, Jesus, I sit above you and I disagree with you and I do so so that I might be holy. Some of you are so proud and so self-righteous and so self-consumed you have a hard time with the imputed righteousness of Christ, the the reckon, the the gifted righteousness of Christ. It's like, oh, I know that's how Jesus sees me, but I just don't want to see myself that way, or what can I do to add to it, or what can I do to participate? You can't. You humble yourself, you receive the gift, and you live a happy new life to God's glory and your joy. For those of you who struggle with this whole ideology that God is a judge and his word is the law and that we are judged by Jesus and we're declared justified, righteous in his sight because of the work of Christ, let me give you another way to see this doctrine of justification. The Bible also says God is a father and that to be a Christian is to be adopted into his family. And what Peter is saying is that God loves all of his children equally. God's not a daddy who plays favorites. Daddies are evil who play favorites. I have five kids, love them all, love them all equally. If I played favorites, that would be evil. How evil would it be for me to look at my five kids and say, well, one of you is gonna be loved in first place, one of you is gonna be loved in second place, one of you is gonna be loved in third place. By the time we get down to fourth place, I don't know how it's gonna go for you. And whoever comes in fifth, well, it's not gonna be a good life for you. So here's daddy's list of merits and demerits. Every day we're going to keep score, kids. Daddy's really religious. If you do a good thing, you get a merit. If you do a bad thing, you get a demerit. At some point in the future, I'm going to have a trial, and we're going to do a tally, and I'm going to love you in order of your performance, your personal righteousness. That's the worst father in the history of the world. He's preaching a false gospel to his children, and we do it all the time when we try to manipulate them through reward and punishment. If you're good, I'll give you a treat. If you're bad, I won't. And this starts early, and it's bred in us from infancy and from our youth. God loves all his kids, and you know what he gives them? The righteousness of Christ. And you know which of his children he gives it to? All of them. And you know how much of Christ's righteousness he gives? All of it. It's not like this person got all of Christ's righteousness and this person got three quarters and this person got a half and there's certain people got to work really hard to contribute to their righteousness or there's others who can lose it because it's a gift of grace and it's full and it's complete and it's sufficient and all you need is the righteousness of Christ. You can't add to it. And because it's grace, you can't take from it. Positionally, you're declared righteous, justified in the sight of Christ through faith by grace. This is the doctrine of justification. If you don't get this, you're not a Christian. If this hasn't happened to you, you're not a Christian. You may be moral. You may be devoted. You may be spiritual. But you're not, you're not justified. Now, this is our legal standing before God, and then he moves on to our lifestyle, 
with God. Our legal standing is settled in heaven and our lifestyle is practiced on earth. And this leads to the second question. If all our sins, past, present, and future are forgiven, if we didn't earn or merit salvation, if we can't unearn or unmerit salvation, why live a holy life? Why not just sin like crazy knowing that Jesus forgives and we're fine? That's the second doctrine, one of my favorite doctrines, a doctrine I've been absolutely captivated by for a year. I'm reading everything on it. I'm mesmerized by it. John Piper's book, Finally Alive, is a good introduction to it. If you get this, this will change everything. And it will liberate you from the performance trap of religion. It's the doctrine of regeneration. Yes, this one's great. This is the Holy Spirit's work in us. On the cross is Jesus' justifying work for us. In regeneration is the Holy Spirit's work in us. God actually does something in us. He changes us, transforms us. I'll get there. I gotta read the verse. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power, God's powerful, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Massive ideas here. God's powerful. And he has called us, compelled us, wooed us, drawn us to himself. That God's seeking us. That God's loving us. That God's pursuing us. And that he has given us divine power. He's given us everything we need for what he calls life and godliness. Friend, if you are a Christian, you lack nothing to live a holy life. You have the Holy Spirit, as we'll examine. You have a new nature. You have the scriptures. You have the church. You have all that you need to walk with God in life and godliness. How? That's the question. 2 Peter 1.4. This is so good. Have I said that? This is so amazing. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Let me explain this to you. He uses that word nature. You are by conception, you are by nature a sinner. Your first parents rebelled against God. You have inherited from them a sinful nature. The psalmist says that you're sinful from your mother's womb. All you need to do to be a sinner is exist. All you need to do to go to hell is be conceived. That's all it takes. You are not a blank slate. You're not a good person. You're not a snowflake, one of a kind, pure white and wonderful. You're bad. You're really, really bad. And some of you say, I'm not bad. That's how bad you are. <laughs> you're so bad, you're in denial. You're the worst of all. We're sinners by nature, choice. We're sinners, we are, because we have a sin nature. The Bible calls it being by nature children of wrath. If all you have is the nature you were born with, you're going to hell, the conscious, eternal suffering and justice of hell. If all you have is your birth nature, you are separated from God. You are blind to the goodness of God. You are dead to the Spirit of God. And so what we need is to be born again. That's what Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter, born again. This is the doctrine of regeneration. The Bible uses other words like to receive a new heart. This is not the physical organ. It's the seat, sum, and center, the essence of who we are. The Bible mentions the heart more than 900 times. Jesus says, your life comes out of your heart. Your desires come out of your heart. Your words come out of your heart. Your sinful lusts come out of your heart. And what happens is this, grotesque religion labors for behavior modification rather than 
regeneration. Regeneration is that God does want your behavior to change, but he starts with your identity, your essence, your heart, your nature. He causes you in the language of the Bible to be born again, to be a new creation in Christ, to use Peter's language, to be a partaker of the divine nature. That's language for the doctrine of regeneration. And as you change in the essence and seat and sum and center of who you are, your mind, your life, your heart, your behavior, your desires, they begin to change. Behavior modification is what our foolish culture and silly religion do. And that is assuming if we can get you to change your behavior, then that will change you. And it doesn't. It doesn't. It simply cannot some of you have tried so long to be a better person, to do better, to try harder. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Jesus says to change your behavior without changing your nature is like trying to grow oranges on an apple tree. It'll never happen. You need to be born again. You need a new nature. You need to be regenerated. You need the Holy Spirit to do this amazing work in you. And if you are a Christian, he already has. Now, let me say this as well. Let me go on a brief excursus for parents. It is so grievous that we have religious, moral, behavior, modification-oriented parenting. And even what passes for Christian teaching on parenting is oftentimes legalistic, moralistic, religious behavior modification. Here's how behavior modification works. Control the environment, threaten, punish, intimidate, and reward. That's how it works. All of which is godless, none of which is regeneration. So what you can get is a moral compliant, obedient child who doesn't act up, doesn't curse, doesn't swear, doesn't steal, and goes to hell. Why? Because it was behavior modification externally, not regeneration internally. And I know parents, you get frustrated with your kids. Like they don't obey. It's because they're unregenerate. What they don't need is behavior modification. What they need is regeneration. They don't need new actions. They need a new heart. The issue is always the heart. And I'm not saying you don't instruct and correct and discipline your children and you don't pray with them and share Jesus with them. You do all of that. I talked to a parent recently. Their kid is too an evil two years of evil. This kid's horrible. I mean, literally, every time I see this kid, I have to come at him sideways because he punches and he's short. He's a bad kid. <laughs> they said, I don't know what's wrong with him. I do. He's unregenerate. He doesn't yet have the divine nature. All he's got is his old, sinful, rebellious, edemic, selfish nature. The kid needs a new nature. And the key is not to get his behavior to change and make him a nice moral atheist. The goal is to introduce him to Jesus. The goal is for the Holy Spirit to do a work in him. The goal is for the Holy Spirit to transform and regenerate his heart so that he lives a different life with different behavior. See, some of you, I, I really want to distinguish for you between religion and regeneration. Religion is what you do for God. Regeneration is what God does in you. Religion is what you do so that God will love you. Regeneration is what God has done in you because he loves you. Religion is about you trying to get closer to God. Regeneration is about God taking up residence in you. Religion and re regeneration are antithetical. That's why the religious guys murdered Jesus. And here's what he says. There are four things that accompany regeneration. That's what Peter says. Being a partaker in the divine nature. And by divine nature, I mean this. It's still you, but it's a new you. It's a totally transformed you. It is an absolutely, unequivocally changed you. You're different. You're different. You're not perfect. You're still in process, but you're different. 
That's why you're a new creation in Christ. That's why Simeon becomes Peter. He becomes such a new man that he literally needs a new name. He's a different guy. He says that this is accompanied with, number one, a new power. Chapter one, verse three, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Being a partaker in the divine nature means you get a new power. Some of you have been powerless to sin. You can't stop. You can't control. You can't manage. You can't. You're out of control. You're out of control. And there's a new divine power given to those who partake in the divine nature that can say no to sin and yes to God. And because Jesus died for sin, you could put your sin to death. You don't need to manage it. You don't need to excuse it. You don't need to blame others for it. You don't need to hide it. You're dead, buried in Christ. Your sin is dead, buried in Christ. And as he rose in newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit, you get to Live a new life by a new power. The Holy Spirit gives you the capacity to live a life and be a person that apart from his work would be absolutely impossible. Some of you are still living by your own power, not the power of the Holy Spirit. We, just so you know this, we love the Holy Spirit. He's God. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is he, not it. He's not just a force. He's a person. He's the third member of the Trinity. He takes up residence in the life of the children of God. He does this amazing, regenerating work where from the inside out, he begins to unleash and share his power so that we can continually grow to be more and more like Jesus. You see, religion says, try harder. And regeneration says, submit to the Holy Spirit. Walk by his power. Secondly, Peter says that those who are partakers of the divine nature have a new understanding. Verse 3, chapter 1, speaks of the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. There's a new knowledge. There's a new understanding. You think differently. Your mind changes. Some of you have been regenerated. And you're here to figure out what even happened. See, I don't cause myself to be born or born again. These are things that are done for me. And then knowledge is where I start to understand what Jesus has done. And it's unbelievable. I I had this amazing conversation with this woman recently. It, It is indicative of how if you're a partaker of the divine nature, if you are being regenerated by God, you have a new knowledge and a new appetite for Bible and scripture and truth. She came up to me. She said, Pastor Mark, can I ask you something? I said, sure. She said, am I a Christian? I'm like, I don't know. It's not like height. We can't just tell. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I said, tell me your story. What's going on in your life? She said, I've never gone to church. I've never really thought about God. And recently I started feeling really bad about some stuff in my life. I said, we call that conviction. That's your conscience and the Holy Spirit convicting you. Knowledge, explaining what's going on. I said, so what happens? She said, so I decided I should go to church and I should learn about God. I want to learn about God, okay? She said, so I went to work and I asked all my coworkers, what's a good church? And they all said, We don't go to church. We have no idea. So I Googled church, and yours came up. So I'm here. And I told her, God is sovereign over Google. Welcome. She said, so I've been coming a few weeks. And she said, you know what? I picked up a Bible, and I started reading it. I said, well, what do you think? She said, I can't stop reading it. I'm totally interested She said, you know what? I have all these questions. New knowledge. It was so cute. She said, you know, I think what would be good is if you guys had groups where people could come and ask her questions. (laughs) That's a great idea. Someone already had it. We have hundreds of those groups. She's like, I could go to a group and I could ask my questions? Oh, yes. Would they be okay with that? Well, they'd be very angry, but they would get over it. <laughs> yeah, they would love to answer your questions. 
I said, give me your address and we'll find one near you. And then you can go and you can meet people who love Jesus and know the Bible and you could answer, you could ask them your questions and they'll answer your questions. She said, that'd be great. I said, well, what do you think about Jesus? She said, I'm thinking about him all the time. She said, I am totally interested in Jesus. She said, quote, I can't even explain it. You know what that is? A partaker in the divine nature. Was she regenerated, being regenerated? God knows who's, who are his, but I'll tell you what, she was being called. Jesus was drawing her to himself. And as she was enjoying the partaking in the divine nature, she longed for new knowledge. She told me, she said, I want to know about Jesus. I want to know what the Bible's talking about. That's what happens. See, if you're new, you need to know this. We do love the Bible, but not in the way that a lot of religious churches do. A lot of religious churches will say this, you need to read the Bible. We say, you get to read the Bible. Either way, you're reading it, but it's a little different motivation. The first is assuming you don't want to, and it's like vegetables. Open up, here they come. <laughs> the second is, if you're regenerated, and the Holy Spirit wrote the Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, He'll give you an appetite for the knowledge of the truth. You'll want to read your Bible. You'll want to study. You'll want to grow. That's why we hate religion. Religion takes what you get to do and turns it into what you have to do. It takes all the joy out of it. Number three, those who are partakers of the divine nature, this is the big idea, actually possess, by God's grace, a new nature. Chapter 1, verse 4, I'll say it again. He has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now let me thread the needle on this. If you've been at Mars Hill for a while, we tell you you're a sinner. We ask you to examine your heart and life for sin. We ask you to repent of your sin and be honest about your sin. And what can happen is you're so familiar with your sin that you forget your divine nature. Let me be careful. I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not saying you're sinless. I'm not saying that you don't need to die and rise and be glorified because it's all taken care of right now. I know you're a work in process, as am I, the Bible calls it sanctification, growing in the likeness of Christ throughout our life. But I talked to someone recently, they came up, and they are a Christian, and they said, well, I'm just nothing but a wicked sinner. That's not true. You're a partaker of the divine nature. Something in you has changed. God has made you a new person. That's what he's done. Don't overlook that. Don't neglect that. It's not just the same old you now trying harder. It's the new you living by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you get that? Most Christians, most Christians that I have met, don't. Don't. They would say, I have a new knowledge, but not a new nature. I'm now aware of how bad I am. And they're not equally aware of what God has done in them. If you're a Christian, you have a new nature. You're a new person. You're a new creation. The Holy Spirit is in you. He's worked in you and he's working in you. And this should give you so much hope and so much encouragement. And even when you're dealing with your Christian friends, you should have hope for them, not because you have hope in them, but because you have hope in the Holy Spirit's work in them. Leads to the fourth point, which I think is the best of all. Most people think I'm saved by grace, kept by works, Jesus justifies me, and I need to work really hard to keep him happy. That's not it. Here's what he says, chapter 1, verse 4. We have new desires. Do you believe that? Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. This absolutely changes everything. When anyone tells me that Christianity is a great religion, I freak out! 
I absolutely blow a gasket. I can barely remain in my own skin. It's not another religion. Religion is about control. Religion is about fear. Religion is about punishment. Religion assumes all you have is this evil, rebellious, sinful, hard-hearted, stubborn, stiff-necked, old nature. We have to control you. We have to intimidate you. We have to manipulate you because deep down, the, the longings of your heart, the desires of your soul, the appetite of your will is just only evil continually all the time. And regeneration says, absolutely not. You have the Holy Spirit. You have a new nature. And you have new, brand new, fresh, living, passionate, free desires. And what happens is, some of you will say, but I'm tempted. There are lesser desires, what he calls sinful desires in the world. Your flesh and the world will conspire to tempt you to settle. And some of you, that word desire, you're like, that's right, desire is bad. No, it's not. Desire is the answer to sin, not the cause of it. When you sin, it's because you have too weak of desires. When you sin, it's not because you're passionate. It's because you're not passionate enough. You're settling. Sex, food, money, gambling, alcohol, fornication, adultery. Christ! Christ! Passion, joy, freedom, happiness, enthusiasm. So much better than these little temptations and these petty pleasures and these Wicked temptations that want us to settle for something or someone other than Jesus. Amen. See, some of you come here and you come from these religious backgrounds and they say, now don't have passion, don't have desires, don't get excited, you'll get into trouble. No, you won't. You'll get into worship. And that'll keep you out of trouble. As I read this book, I see passionate people, living people, yelling people, dying people, suffering people, happy people. I see people who change the whole world because they had desires. And you know what? Those desires were God's desires. That as the Holy Spirit took up residence in them, their desires were awakened, their desires were transformed, their passions were ignited. They couldn't be constrained. They couldn't be restrained. It was not about what they had to do. It was about what they got to do. It wasn't that they needed to make God happy. It's that in Christ, they were already justified. And all of that was established. And through the Holy Spirit, they were regenerated. And life was to be lived. And Christ was to be known. And life was to be savored. And Christ was to be thanked. And what we want for you, what I'm jealous for you, is to be a passionate people with deep desires. Go for the deep desires, the deepest desires down in your new nature, the deep desires down in your regenerated heart, the deep desires down where the Holy Spirit rules and reigns. Please don't settle for less. We are a church that oftentimes lacks in passion, not in knowledge. We love the Lord our God with all of our mind. But we tend to be a church that is weak in passion. And the key is not to talk about passion. And the key is not to feel guilty so that you'll try and be passionate out of your religious guilt. And the key is not to show you passionate people and say, see, there's varsity. The key is to give you this knowledge that the Holy Spirit, if you are a child of God, he is in you. And he has passion for you to live a life for Christ. It's the best, happiest, most joyous, thrilling, satisfying life there is. It's the only life there is. It's the only life that never ends. I really, I want you, I, I beg of you to be considering your own heart. First question is, are you justified? Have you received the righteousness of Christ? Have you repented of your sin? Are you a Christian? That's first. 
if you are. Second question is, what is the Holy Spirit doing in you? What are the deep desires of your heart? Where have you been not passionate enough and not desiring enough and not tenacious enough and you've settled for sin when you could have Christ? What are you thinking? And ask the Holy Spirit to give you his, quote, divine power. He wants to. Do you believe that? He's not holding anything back. Some of you say, well, I didn't know this. That's why he says that knowledge is key. Understanding this power of the Holy Spirit that is accessible to the children of God allows us to then prayerfully ponder and biblically consider, Lord God, what are my deepest desires? What are my regenerated desires? What are my strongest passions? What are my most voracious appetites? What are my most necessary longings? And pursue them passionately. And sin and temptation will seem less appetizing. You will enjoy freedom. You will enjoy life. You will enjoy holiness, and you will enjoy Christ, and you'll be a happy people. You'll be a contagiously happy people. Marcel, I, I love you, and I am desperate for you to enjoy this grace of God. I want you, I want you to enjoy your fullness in Christ and to live out of that place of regenerated joy and not religious guilt. I'm going to pray for you. That's all I can do. I can't justify you. I can't regenerate you. I can't connect you to your deepest desires. The Holy Spirit needs to do this, but I could pray. Father God, I pray that out of this knowledge of Jesus' justifying work for us and the Holy Spirit's regenerating work in us, that, Lord God, right now you would give faith to those who don't have it, and that, Lord God, for those who have partaken of the divine nature, that right now your Holy Spirit would reveal to them sin in their life, that they might repent of it because Jesus died for it, and they might pursue their deepest desires, their spirit-given desires, their longings of the regenerated heart. God, I pray that they would enjoy being a free people and a happy people and a passionate people and a worshipful people and a contagious people. Holy Spirit, I'm humbly requesting. I can't, I can't demand of you anything. You are God, but I humbly request that our people would enjoy you. In Jesus' name, amen.